what's going on y'all back with another video so in this video i want to talk about everything that happened after april 15th now i also want to give a trigger warning because i may speak about some very sensitive things in this video you know so it is dealing with um of course narcissism parents the narcissistic family dynamic and everything leading up to losing a narcissistic parent. So as y'all know, for those of you who's, you know, been um, keeping up, I, uh, my old man, his mother passed away last month on the 15th. So she passed away April 15th. And when he had got, and also he had given me permission to talk about this. It's only so much I'm going to speak on. I'm not going to go into too, too many details because some of you may see this in bad taste. But the purpose of this video is just to spread awareness. It's for educational purposes. It's not to bash anyone. I'm not coming on here to bash either his mother or his family. I just want to point out some things that I have witnessed since then. And again, like I say, you know, I've gotten his permission to do this. It is his story to tell, so I'm only going to speak on so much of it. You know, y'all understand that. So, April 15th, he got the phone call that morning that his mother passed, and we were on the phone at the time. So, when he clicked over, for some reason, it's like I felt like he was about to get that kind of bad news. When he clicked back over to me, he told me that. Man, my mama just passed. And, um... But it was the way he said it. He said, man, that was my brother. My mama just passed. And you know, y'all can imagine you just finding out that your mother passed over the phone. A lot of times people lose family, parents. They're in a hospital or something on the deathbed. And you get the call that the family should report to the hospital or facility, wherever, you know, the loved one is. But he got the call like that from the brother who was at the house, he has three siblings, uh, two brothers, one older than him, one younger than him, and uh, the baby is the only girl in the family, the baby sister. So the thing about it is once he found out, I was just at a loss for words. I really didn't know what to say other than you need me to be there, would you? Let me know if you need me to come over. So I was trying to see if he wanted me to come to his house. And um, he was just like, no, I'm just gonna, um, you know, sit here for a minute and then go over to the house and be with my brothers. I was like, okay, we talk to your sister. He was like, no, I, once they told me that, you know, he just clicked back over to me. So I, I really didn't know what to say, but it's like right before he, he answered that call. Cause when we were on the phone, the phone was blowing up and I'm like, well, answer the phone or call him back. It's like, a, I felt it. I just felt like he was about to get that bad news. Thing about it is he didn't have a close relationship with his mother. And he had expressed to me what their relationship was like and how he had always felt like the uh, scapegoat or the black sheep of the family or the one that got away to survive. And he had went through a lot of manipulation and abuse, you know, uh, mental abuse in that family. He was always tricked to believe that something is wrong with him. You know, you're not worthy of this and that. You know, you you won't succeed. You know, that's not for you. Uh, leave that alone. Uh, you know, you're you're not good for that and and stuff like you know what you go through in a narcissistic family dynamic. So. Not only him, I'm pretty sure the other siblings went through the same thing. I'm telling y'all just bits and pieces. And because everything happened so soon, suddenly, the emotions were so raw. I didn't want to speak on it right away. I did because of how fast things were going and how everything that I thought, you know, that I can imagine a person would go through with the North parent, then losing one, everything that I had imagined, I I kind of knew it would it would play out that way, but 
you know, just to let things kind of, um, you know, just, just to wait until time pass and, you know, they bury their mom and everything. I wanted to wait before I speak on it. I didn't want to speak on it so soon with, you know, emotions being so raw and everything being so sudden. And respect to him as well. And on top of that, again, he did give me the okay to talk about this. So, um, leading up to before they got ready to, you know, prepare services for their mother, he would get with family, but it's like the family was kind of leaving him out. And when you are the scapegoat of the family, you probably can expect that from your other siblings because that's how the mother or the father made it in the household. They only allowed you to be involved so much of the time and you knew your role to play. That's why a lot of time when a scapegoat grows up and moves away from the home, they stay away. They set boundaries and they're not even expecting, they're not planning to set boundaries, but they find their peace. They find their safe space and they stay away from this toxic environment. And he has never spoken on setting boundaries with family. He just always said, I just keep my distance from them because every time I go around, it's always the same thing. He has been very vocal about what's happening. And that's how I know that it's a narcissistic family environment. Not saying all siblings are narcissists, but they were groomed to be as the leader wanted them to be, which was the mother. So, you know, imagine the trauma that he went through coming up in that dynamic and finally growing up to get away. It's so, so much I could tell y'all. I will not try to squeeze it all in this video. I'll tell y'all bit by bit as time go by because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of so much of it that I have forgotten about for now, but it probably will come up later, you know, and then I'll speak on it. The thing is, coming up to, uh, you know, arranging services and stuff for the mom, of course, you have to look through paperwork and look up policies, insurance policies, life insurance policies to see what's what and what she left behind. So to backtrack a little bit real quick, before she passed, it was, we were out of work, I think a week for the Easter break, a day and a week, you know. And so she had called them on that Good Friday and told them that for Easter Sunday, uh, you know, I want you to come over. Like she would always kind of demand his presence or reserve his presence. And of course he would decline or come up with an excuse not to show up. He always would do that when I would tell him, just be honest and let them know why you're not comfortable coming over. You know, he always mentioned things never change. That's how it is in the North family, especially when you're the scapegoat. Nothing is going to change. And everybody is expecting you. They're waiting for you so they could just grill you the moment you show up, you know, and punish you for staying away. That's how it is in the North family. So he declined about going over there for Good Friday for the little get together and everything. And then that um, for that Easter Sunday, she was like, if you're not coming over for Easter Sunday, um, I'm not doing much, but I have baskets. You know, a lot of y'all still, we, for those of you who celebrate Easter and you do the whole, the Easter basket, the eggs, stuff like that for the kids, the candy and all that, the Easter egg hunt. Some people still celebrate it to where they they buy gifts for adults or they make Easter baskets for their adult children and stuff like that. If I was to do it for my son, I would put like cologne in it. I would put things in it for a male, things that I know he like. You know, I would fix it up for an adult. Same thing with my daughter, put perfume in it, perfume. I will put jewelry in it, a tennis bracelet, things like that for my daughter, you know. But for adults, I wouldn't fix it up as it's their children. And so that's what she had did. She had fixed up them a nice little Easter basket like it's for kids. Well, it wasn't even a basket. It was just a little tiny gift bag. And she filled it up with candy. And that's it. And 
again, y'all, I don't, y'all might be like, why you talk about that boy mama and she paid, you know, but I'm bringing this out to let y'all know what happens in the family when you have a narc parent and how you are treated as an outsider when you decide to set boundaries, you know, how you're treated so different and you kind of get used to it. So it's just like, you brace yourself for what you're heading into when you decide to come around the family. That's why I'm speaking on this. Again, for educational purposes only, not to bash anyone. That's what the whole purpose of this channel is about. You know, if it's too much for y'all, if it's too triggering, if it's in bad taste, you know, I'm sorry y'all could tune out if that's what you need to do. But I do need to speak on it because that's what I'm going to do. So... Once she called them and told them to come over, I have baskets. It was like so demanding. You didn't show up for Good Friday, but you can show up to pick up this basket for my grandson, his son. His son was his late wife. Um, the boy is 17 years old, and she got a little basket filled with candy for him. Again, it wouldn't be my choice to fix a gift like that for a person of their age. You know, I would fix it something that kind of fits the age range. And then candy. It's like that's the easiest thing to give to someone. To me, all narcissists do that. They give you the, they find a quick and easiest way to give you something just to get the credit for doing so. So that's what she did. He went to pick up. He was like, okay. My mom called me and it was like, he always let me know. My mom called me again. She keep telling me to come by and pick up, you know, the Easter basket that she got for my son. And so I'm gonna go by, cause he was taking like night classes. He take like night classes. And um, he was like, when I leave class tonight, I'm going by my mom's house to pick up what she got, you know, the Easter gift she got for my son. He did that. He called me and said, I, I just left my mama house. He said, she gave me the candy for my son and she gave me two more gifts to drop off to my brother. Cause on his way home, he would pass by his brother's and his girlfriend's house. He was like, and she gave me two other gifts to drop off to my brother and his girlfriend. And she didn't give me nothing. And he always would do this nervous laugh, which a lot of narc victims would do just to kind of pass off how they really feel. It's like, I'm not surprised, but at the same time, it still hurts them to know that they've been excluded yet again, you know, from being a part of something that the person should want to include them on. Look like if you're giving to your other children, why not this one? Why you're not giving the same treatment to this one? So when he left her house, before he left her house, he did explain to me that she didn't look so well. He said she just was in the bed, and I kept asking, is she okay? Is she okay? He was like, because she suffered with asthma. He was like, she just was saying that, um, she said, I stopped taking my asthma pump because the steroids was making me feel worse. And now I just got these body aches. So I'm going to the doctor soon to get some more pain medicine because my legs keep bothering me. And she had, when we were talking, she used to always tell me that her legs were bothering her a lot. Her legs were bothering her and she was seeing a heart doctor. So after he told me that, let me see, it was going, it was, that was the Sunday. No, Monday, he stopped by there to pick up the stuff to drop off to his brother, his brother, girlfriend, and his son. Let me see, this Tuesday, I think he was in school. He said, man, I just left class, had a, you know, a good productive night because he do welding in the class. And he was like, I'm getting ready to head to the next level in class now. And that's something he had been struggling with. So I was happy for him and everything. He was like, but my mama had called me and she was fussing, talking about you, you came over, when you came over here to get the candy, you took too many pieces of candy off the table. You know, you always do that. You know, just fussing at him about taking, eating more pieces of candy than normal. 
So he was like, I was like, what? You know, like, she calling me about that. I couldn't even get a word in and let her know that I'm doing good in school. Not that she ever cared, but, you know. And it's like he was always trying to push off his progression, uh, you know, to her to get that. This is what you do when you in a narc family and you are the scapegoat. You like them to know all the good news that's going on with you, but trust and believe they don't care. They don't care to hear that. They're going to blow it off. They're going to jump subject. They don't want to hear that. They're going to downplay it. They're going to make fun of it. They're going to be very sarcastic. So it's like you're wasting your time sharing your good news with people who have always shown you that they don't care. You know. So he was like, she just called me fussing about I ate too many pieces of candy when I came over there. I don't know what that was all about. But anyway, um, I was asking her how she feel and she just said she feel okay. She's still having pains in her legs and stuff. So that was that. And she had always said that in the past over the last year or so. So, of course, he wasn't thinking nothing of that because she believed in going to the doctor for pain pills. But it was something else about that. It was like, you're not doing something else you're being told to do by the doctor. You're just doing enough to give you, you know, that relief for the moment. But anyway, and so that was Monday. No, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning had come. I think that was the 15th. I think, I'm not sure. Friday or Saturday, the 15th, that's when he had got that phone call that his mother had passed. And so, again, when he went over to the house and the brothers was there, it was just like everybody was all over the place. I'm going by what he told me, you know, it's just something they wasn't expecting but he said when he talked to his brother his brother said well she the oldest brother said well she told me not to tell y'all but she called the ambulance three days ago so i'm like that must have been the night that you went by there i mean that she called you and told you you ate too many candies and he said she just always was fussing at me never had nothing good to say she didn't want to hear about what was going on with me in school Every time I try to talk to her about his son and the sports he play and how good he's doing and the awards that he's up for, she didn't want to hear it. You know, she just always negative, negative. That's what he was saying. And I was like, so, you know, like, okay. And the brother was like, yeah, she told me not to say nothing. She called the ambulance. So when they all was over there, they looked through paperwork and they found that the ambulance had come by there for her and said that her vitals was good enough for her to, you know, she didn't need to be transported to the hospital, but they was advising her to go and she refused. She refused to go. She had told her oldest son not to say nothing to the rest of them, and he didn't. And I'm feeling that maybe they could have had saved her if she had went to, went to the hospital that night that she called him fussing. And I was just like, you know, we can't look at the woulda and coulda. It happened, you know. It, she didn't pass already. So you can't change that. So now they're dealing with just, you know, arranging funeral services for their mom. They called him over. They like, you know, families down here, grandma. I live, we live in Baton Rouge and their family is predominantly from New Orleans. So they like the family is will be down here. My grandmother aunts, uncles, everybody, everybody who's going to help us with everything. They called him over there and said, you need to be here for blah, blah, blah. So I'm like probably going through, you know, insurance policies, wheels, whatever she left behind. They, He said when I made it over there, and I, I felt this already. I just already knew this, like, come on now. What are the chances that it'll be otherwise? He said when I made it there, everyone had already went over the paperwork and the thing about it is they weren't really talking to me so what you calling me over here for he said i sat at the table they was like you need to go look at the stuff on the paper you need to go look through the paperwork and tell us what you think about it he looked through everything she 
had a nice size policy she left behind that she only left to his older brother, the one younger than him and the baby. She excluded him. He was excluded from everything. Again, I wasn't surprised when he told me that. And I kind of feel like deep down inside, he wasn't either, you know, but he kept talking about it. So he would go outside as we texting and I'm calling him to check on him, you know, because I kept saying, let me drive you over there. Let me do, but I didn't want to be too, too pushy because sometimes people just need their space to, you know, grieve on, deal with things on their own. And I don't even think he had begun grieving yet. It was so sudden. So she excluded him from everything when when you deal with things like that coming up in the toxic environment and you kind of know that role you play, you accept it, and you also see where you stand in the future. So it's like he kind of already knew he would be excluded, but he kept speaking on it like that, that had to be her last blow to me. You know, that, that would be her last blow for her to call me and tell me she got things for everybody but me, for her to call me and fuss at me about something so petty as eating too many pieces of candy out the candy dish. And and then this this was the final blow when he was just like, I'm done. I'm not even going back over there. They got that. They can handle it. She excluded me from everything. He just kept saying she excluded me from everything, but the family kept reaching out to him, calling him, you need to be here. You need to be here, you know, and don't forget to check on your brothers and sisters and stuff. And I'm like, but were they checking on you? They couldn't be blind to how your mother treated you all these years. They couldn't be blind to that. He was even neglected at one part of his life and sent away to live with another family. It's like, why everybody just turn a blind eye and sweep everything under the rug in a narcissistic family and think that you're supposed to just suck it up, deal with it, and move on? They really expect you to deal with things that way. And my thing is, I want y'all to know that just because a person has passed on and when they were alive and had such strong narcissistic traits and and treated people so bad just because they pass on doesn't excuse the fact that they did what they did when they were here that's why i did that video about the church because when we sitting in a funeral it's just like everything is just so orchestrated in a catholic funeral home or uh, the catholic funeral services it's just like um she just kind of like calculated and planned out her whole life for it to go that way. And it was like, and then the last final blow had to make him feel worse than she ever had. It had to be the last blow to him. Like you were never loved, you know, like just to let him know I never love you. And I want you to know that. And she really took that to her grave. Like narc parents will really let you know how they feel in life as well as in death, like they will let you know, I don't care about you. I never loved you. You don't matter to me. You'll never be anything to me. And it's just like, the question is why, why him? Why the one person in the family is to be treated that way and the other family just sit around and don't care. Nobody sees this. Nobody ever witnessed this. Nobody ever had something to say about this. Everybody was just okay with this one person being isolated and excluded or treated badly like that. Nobody cared. Like, that is what baffles me. And I'm still learning. Like, as I'm learning this, I'm passing it on to y'all, hopefully, so you could know that I wouldn't put nothing past no nort. I don't care how old they are, what role they play in my life. I don't put nothing past none of them. Like, they will take it to their grave how much they hate you when you got away. It had to start. Like, getting to know people at the funeral and learning. And I'm going to talk to y'all. It's a lot to unpack. Finding out things made things so much clearer. But not so much about it being clear. It's how heartbreaking it is to know that this happened in this person's life. 
and they survived it and they're still getting through it, you know, and they wear it well. Like they didn't let it break them, you know. Again, when I met him, I wasn't so sure about where things would go with us because it was sudden. It was kind of rushed. I jumped into it with him. And I seen a lot of his mom in him and still do. It's like I got to like, look, point it out to him real quick when I see it because I got zero tolerance for it. But the thing about it is I know God brought me in his life for a reason. And it was like to help him to point out what it was that he was dealing with for confirmation. You know, I know that. I already knew when God put that in my spirit, what my role was to play in his life in the beginning. And as things progress, it's like everything is just coming so clearer. And, you know, and it's just something to think about that giving the narcissist the benefit of the doubt, you're wasting your time because they're not going to change. They will take those cold treatments with them to the grave. Like they don't care to put somebody through something like that. The best thing to do is to keep your distance. Keep your distance to keep your peace. He did the right thing. He did. But I just want to say this real quick for in this video. Again, I got more to talk about. I just don't want to squeeze everything into this video. Dealing with losing a narc parent is more than just I lost a parent. It's I lost a parent I wish I had, you know. The person who I never met. The person who showed me, you know, one day that I, I'm loved and then the next day you're not. You know, it was never something that made him feel secure in the relationship with his mother. He always kind of knew that you're going to do it again. You're going to do it again because that's who you are, you know. So that's why he created that space for himself to just stay away, you know. And, and I commend him for that. I don't blame him for that. I don't blame anyone who stays away from their narc parents because you deserve better. You don't deserve to be beaten on, constantly criticized, and, and just put down just because you exist. Like, what is the deal? Why you had such a cold heart to me? Not only just to him, because she's just like that with everybody. Like, all the siblings got their story to tell. I talked to them. They told me things again, you know. And it's sad. It's just all around sad story. But losing a narc parent is different from how I lost my parent. Like, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I lost somebody who didn't provide the full potential of nurturing me, loving me, protecting me, and, and you know, guiding me up to be, you know, the best person that I could be. Like, I didn't feel like that. I mean, I got all of that from my mother. A lot of people, you know, that's a good thing to have. A good, stable, healthy home environment to come up in, even if you weren't raised by your parents. But to be brought up with someone who has constantly showed you they don't love you the way you deserve to be loved, like, and you're just like a burden, you know, like, why were you ever born? You know, just easy, a uh, easy throwaway child. That's what this person's, that's what you'll see a person mourn when they lose a parent. They're losing what they wish they could have had, you know, and the pain of knowing that it could have been better. I wish I could have done something better, but then I tried and tried and tried. And then you start to feel guilty when you were staying away for so long. It's just like all that stuff bottled up is going on inside a person's mind when they lose their narc parent. You know, escaping a narc environment, you, you'll feel guilty at some point because 
not only did they make you feel bad for staying away, but when you were there, they wanted you to leave. You know, it's like they teach the other siblings how to treat you. So it's like you really just don't know how to be with none of them. Because I said, you can see the distance between y'all. Like, there's no closeness. Like, me and my sister, were different. But with y'all, it's just like, you're always getting to know each other every time you're in, around. It's like you're talking to a stranger, a cousin that live upstate you haven't seen in a long time. When you live no more than five minutes away from each other in the same city. That's the distance that she created between them. The whole conquer and divide thing. She had to do that to keep their power in their family dynamic. And, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like she succeeded in what she wanted to do. But I will say, you know, when I mentioned in the last video about the churches and stuff and how the church has been getting it wrong in the sermons and all this old sugar coating and we just got to forgive. We got to forgive. When are we going to point out what this person really left behind? How they really hurted somebody? Yeah, the person survives. They live on. They thrive. They get through it. They may not get over it, but they, they learn to understand it wasn't my fault I was treated that way. But at the same time, when are you going to hold people accountable in life and in, in death? Like, Stop saying forgive and they're forgiven and we pray that God let them into the kingdom of it. Like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's what I meant in the last video. Like, when is the church going to at least say, you know, I hope that God healed this person from what made them that way in their, in their imperfections? say that don't just sugarcoat everything it's just like sitting in that service i felt so out of place like i want to say something because it's not real they really don't keep it real with you and you're supposed to be at the head of the church you're supposed to be the one leading the people in the right direction you know like it just seemed so fake to me and i know that you don't want to <laughs> You don't want to just make it about the message about judging somebody, you know, because we all got to go before God and answer to our sins. We all do. But when are you going to hold folks accountable for what they've done? Like, why can't we do that, you know, in the living <laughs> while we're still here? Why does it always have to be covered up and buried with us? You know, because we still got to go before God, even while we're sleeping. When in death, while we're sleeping, we still got to go before God one day and be judged for the life we lived, the choices we make, our intentions, our heart, you know. But at least pray that the person would be healed you know, don't just say God forgives. We know God forgives. But what about teaching these people here in front of you? You know, not to live that way. Get help. Go get help. Question your own thoughts. You know, ask yourself, is, is this right to treat this person that way? At least try to make it a teachable moment. Instead of just covering things up and making it seem like... Not that it was okay, but, you know, don't hold that against them. Everybody don't hold grudges. Some people heal and they move on and they just learn from the past of dealing with that person that I don't want to deal with you anymore, you know. But don't make people, like the church also have a habit of making people feel guilty because you cut people off and they bring up, well, you know, God forgives and he didn't just cut you off. But at the same time, you had to be held accountable for your actions. Yes, he forgives, but you got to admit to your wrongs as well. He's not going to bless you while you're constantly mistreating people, hurting people, and doing wrong in life. He bless you when you do right. You know, he judge you by your heart and your intentions, the moves you make. 
he knows. Like, you can fool the people all the time, but you can't fool God none of the time. So it's like, you can't fool me with these same old sermons that they they make in the front of the church, whether it's just a regular church service or a funeral. Let's keep it real with the people. That's how the people is going to grow and perish. I mean, that's how the people is going to grow, you know. Uh, that's really all I want to talk about is just to let y'all know everything that had happened leading up to her passing and after and how he was just excluded from everything, you know, and how these these other siblings are going to come into so much money that could have helped him. This is your child who needs to help more than anything. He's the one who's, you know, dealing with the, the stage four kidney failure. He's the one on dialysis treatment. He's the one with limited income. He's the one that's still trying to thrive and, and make something out of himself. The other's not doing, going as hard as he is, you know, and it's like you're giving to them so easy for something that they're not even working hard towards. Not to make this about money, because I don't care. It don't got nothing to do with me anyway. But I'm just looking at the ways of a narcissist and how they live and treat you and how they take that with them like you just really can't expect nothing different so if y'all had to deal with the narcissistic parent if you come up in that kind of household or with the siblings you know i would love to hear your stories leave it down below and we can talk about it you know and let me know if y'all think that, that i'm wrong you know coming before y'all with this again it's something that he he's okay with it's the truth, and I stand on the truth. I don't care who it is. It can be my, it, you can be my child who's a narc, and I'm going to put you out there. You know, I'm going I'm to, you know, you know, I hold myself accountable for when I'm wrong. Point out when I'm wrong. Let me know. Let me know how you feel, but that's all I want to really talk about in this video, just firsthand experience dealing with losing a narc parent not you know my personal experience but being with someone who's going through it like everything that i could imagine is true and a hurtful thing about it is being with someone who's going through it because he's not going through it alone you know i tell him i'm with you through this i'm, I'm gonna be with them through this but it's hard it's hard because you take on that pain you take on everything that he's dealing with. Like, I even lost my appetite for a while. I suffered that death as well because I wanted nothing more than to have a good relationship with his mother, to have that mother-in-law bond. And when we get married, just have this huge celebration of love and, and life together, all of us. And it's like, I didn't get a chance to experience that. She took that away long before she took sick and passed. And she had been suffering in pain and wanted to keep it covered. You know, she didn't want them to know about it. And I, I just don't get it, you know. It's like you, you left a lot of hurt behind for people to deal with and figure out on their own. You know, and I just sympathize with them so much. Because I know it hurts. I can feel it. I can see it. It hurts. And I see the confusion, you know. And I'm just here for them the best way I know how. Um, it has been draining. But it's worth it being there for him. Because he needs that more than anything now. He really needs it more than anything now. And he still have some good people there too, reaching out and checking on him. But just to know that it ended that way, it's a huge blow. And it really hurts. It really hurts, you know. So, again, thank y'all for watching. Uh, leave y'all thoughts down below. Leave any questions down below if you have any questions for me pertaining to this video or anything else. So, y'all can email me. Y'all know how to reach me. Everything is in the description. So, again, I want to thank y'all for watching.
and I will talk to you soon.